we instinctively know that people construct their religion according to their geographical and cultural context. Desert people don't create gods of lightning and mountain people don't worship river gods. This axiom is an integral part of A Song of Ice and Fire. It is especially apparent in the story of Daenerys as through her we get to know the culture of the Dothraki which is inherently rooted in where they live and how their surroundings shape everything that they do. And I mean everything. Hi everybody, welcome back to a new long overdue and very special new rereading video. In this video we will dive into Daenerys 3 of A Game of Thrones which has her riding with the Kalasar across the plains of Essos, pontificating about social norms and structures, the natural world and the gods and who controls them. And we have a very, very special guest whom you know very well, even though you didn't know that you know him. Hi, Omri. Hi. Omri Ariel, how are you doing? Actually, I am a little bit sick, but uh, okay. <laughs> so you are a co-founder of Got Academy. Yes. And you were the editor of Got Academy. Correct. Correct. Uh, the funny bits, the Q&As, mm -hmm. funny intros, that's you. Welcome back to Bot Academy. Hi, Tamar. And you are also Itamar's brother. Yes. Okay. And also you're a writer, a history buff, and we have a new podcast together that fits some somehow by some divine intervention fits very well into this chapter yes it's called a podcast of biblical proportions hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of biblical proportions yeah it's about the old testament uh, we say the bible because for us the bible is the old testament it's a non-scholarly point of view basically because we like to dive in into their cognitive mind and their perspective their point of view like George R. R. Martin does with his characters, mm -hmm. to find out their naivety and their unknowns and their known unknowns in their lives and how that shaped the story that they wrote, edited, and then told, and how that story was perceived by the people who he heard that story. Right. So here they don't write their stories uh, on a piece of paper or parchment, but they tell their stories that are totally 100% rooted in their way of life on horse mm -hmm. in planes and that creates a specific uh, kind of religion and we will go through it but that's actually very similar to all yeah. religions it's not only manifested in their religion and their quote-unquote ideology meaning that uh, the right and wrong that the religion tells them or the limits of their uh, actions it's also influenced their cognitive uh, point of view their mm -hmm. own brains perceptions yeah okay i have an example uh, for this and i wrote it down as geography is destiny so the first words in the chapter are the dothraki sea so this is how they experience life they have the plain stretched out immense and empty a vast expanse that reached to the distant horizon and beyond this is how they experience their day-to-day -day lives exactly so if you experience in your day-to-day -day lives, vast oceans of uh, desert and grass, then your perception, your cognitive perception, mm -hmm. your ego, quote-unquote, in the Freudian sense, the point of view of life that guards you from your uh, emotions mm. and uh, the, the unknowns of the, okay. uh, and the, chaos, the chaos of... Uh, is? <laughs> is? We want to know the answer. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about their inner world how it is uh, derived from what they see in the outer world. They don't talk about cities or mountains. In mountains, you don't go out and become a conqueror yeah. in the mountains. Yeah. No, this is something that you have to see everything stretched out in front of you. Okay, I can just go. So I can take everything. This is part of the rules of the game. 
And if you're on an island, you have an island mentality. Yeah. So it's not only that the vast space that they, they are living their day-to-day life created these deities that tell them according to their day-to-day life what to do and not to do. It's also physically and emotionally impact their minds and their way of thinking. Mm-hmm. So it's not only that they ride horses to, so their god is horse god. It's they, they ride horses and experience total freedom in a, mass, a massive desert of uh, green and uh, blue or whatever that uh, sub- Jorah explains, uh, Danny, the changing of, uh, yeah, of the seasons. Yeah. It's no coincidence that they don't have a city that they dwell in. They have this emotional and physical instinct and uh, motive to keep on moving and keep on experiencing this yes. vast desert. And when we talk about the Bible and the Old Testament, it's not only that we say that, uh, okay, they are desert people, so they, uh, when they imagine a God, then, then the God is uh, desert-like, you know. Uh, or when a uh, Norwegian imagine a God, is uh, Thor-like. Okay. It's the fact that they imagine Thor, that it, it has some kind of an uh, influencing uh, mechanism upon their cognitive abilities, cognitive imagination, cognitive expressions, and... Uh, Yes, 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 yes. So here, for example, the, you mentioned the colors of the, the, grass. Of the grass. So when it's uh, all red, it's a sea of blood. Mm-hmm. They imagine a sea of blood. Someone else living in another place where everything blooms red will see beauty and life. But this is not the reality of their geography that created uh, this culture. And when it's dry, it's the color of bronze. That sounds, again, very weapony. So their options of seeing and describing the world are linked to, to the surroundings. To their day-to-day li- lives, lives. And experiences. Yeah. yeah, so they can't see the, the blooming as something beautiful. And someone else will not, will not imagine a sea of blood. This is very uh, props to this George guy. Yeah. <laughs> the Dothraki claim that someday ghost grass will cover the entire world and then all life will end. So here it's like uh, some kind of a, a point of singularity in their imagination because the grass and the changing of the grass and the colors, it's like the, the vivant life experience of life itself. It's life itself, basically. The circular season and everything. So that way you can see that the limit of the imagination They can't imagine something beyond that. Yes. So the end of the world, their myth about the end of the world is just ghost grass. That is something similar that we try to do in the podcast uh, on the Bible. is trying to extrapolate mm-hmm. but by imagining the limits of their imagination. Yes. And here we see that the beyond, they can't even imagine because their perspective and their uh, world of... Phenoms, a world of uh, images, is only uh, the grasslands and the vast, uh, the vast steppes. So their end of the world mythology, mythology yes. is s- strictly connected to the things that they can see themselves, not yes. uh, imagining beyond that. And here we can say that it's a singular, like a point of sing- singularity, like the be- you can't see beyond mm. what happened in the dark hole. Because we can't even imagine it. It's beyond our perception. Right. Maybe aliens or humanoids yes. 2,000 years from now will say, uh, yeah, it's, it's well known that after the event horizon, it's A, B, C, blah, 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 blah. But we can't even imagine it. So here, the, mm. the ghost grass is like the point of the event horizon for them. Oh, it's very interesting. Also, the, the way that they have uh, different, many different words to describe grass. This is like the well-known thing about uh, Inuits, Inuits yeah. that have uh, 40 words for uh, snow, snow or, white, yeah. or something like that. And in Chinese, uh, you don't have the word for either brown or yellow. I, don't know, I think brown, it's just dark yellow. Mm-hmm. So it affects the way that they, that they, see, that they see those colors. And in English, you have crow and you have raven. <laughs> in Hebrew, we don't have crow and raven. We just have crow. Or raven. Or raven. I see <laughs> <Or> crow. <laughs> and that's it. Right. So we have a problem uh, differentiating in the story yeah. between the crows and the ravens. I think in the book, it's uh, the three-eyed crow, not the three-eyed raven. But you have raven. 
Right, Raven, they are the ones that bring the messages. Yeah, and you have the White Raven. So they are the docile ones, maybe. Maybe the ones that you... I have no idea, because when I try to, to see the differences between a Raven and a Crow, I went to Google Images, and it, <laughs> I don't see a difference. Maybe in the color, maybe in the size a little bit. Maybe the bit. size. Maybe the size. So to that point, there's something that is uh, not really Dothraki, but related to Daenerys. So her dreams have dragons. She has a dragon dream. That is something that is, that is initiated, not in her experiences, because this is a magical, uh, yeah. supernatural story, something that is inside her. In her blood. She doesn't have uh, dreams about the North, mm -hmm. about the others. No, this is something that the Northern people, the Northerners yeah. will have. They won't have the dreams of dragons. Maybe. Yeah, but here I think it's not that scientific. <laughs> It's yeah, not like, yeah. uh, let's see what the limits of uh, Daenerys' imagination are, because the, she's a magical creature, so... We can talk, okay, let's talk a, lot, a, a little bit about the actual uh, peoples that lived uh, in this way for thousands of years across the, what's called the Eurasian steppes. It's from Ukraine in the, in the west, all the way to Siberia mm -hmm. and the China yeah. uh, in the east. Yeah. It's very large roaming uh, peoples who have adapted in, 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 a cultural, in, in a cultural evolution to this way of living because you had, to ha you had to ride a horse, you had to be able to take food from people who grow food because you can grow food and then take it back. As time progressed, they got more and more and more that way. And the, like the Mongolians, their god, he was a sky god. Mm -hmm. So that's directly related to the fact that they are going over vast distances yeah. and their gods are with them. Yeah. He's not in Jerusalem, he's not in Mecca, yeah. he's not in the Vatican. Yeah. No, he's everywhere with you. So uh, there's a quote uh, in it that even uh, Daenerys notices that uh, the Dothraki horde is like a moving city. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. And the fact that horses are something integral for their survival, it creates a whole culture based on the horse. So when later in the book, uh, Drogo will fall from his horse, mm -hmm. will fall from his horse. So, and what does she do here to Viserys? She takes his she horse. She takes his horse, yeah. He He's a walker. Walk. Yeah. Wow. So it wouldn't be that harsh, whatever, in Britain. Yeah. It could be just like a regular punishment. Okay, now you walk, I'm taking your horse. Whatever, in, yeah. way, in the north. Yeah, but here it has a cultural significance. Taking away uh, your horse is similar to maybe a cop. You take away his gun. Mm -hmm. It's not only a procedural thing that he's under this, he or she is under investigation, so they need to uh, deposit yeah. their gun. Yes. It's also when they come back to the office without a gun, uh -huh. it's something that... Uh, yes especially in a macho, patriarchal, aggressive society as a police department or horse people. Yeah. The fact that you take away your main, I don't know. Yes. A weapon, it's not even a word to describe. Your it. phallus. Even if I, <laughs> it's phallus and something else. Uh -huh. you know? It's your phallus and your toga, maybe, you know. Uh -huh. Your phallus and your uniform. Your, or your cross. Uh, yeah, or your, or your cross. Yeah, something like that. Right, right, right. Well, without your horse, right. It's not that you're not a man. You're it's, not even a person. Yeah. yeah. You're right. not only emasculated, you're right. dehumanized. Dehumanized, right, right. B because we as humans, we always build stories around what we see in the world. Mm -hmm. And for example, we talked about it uh, on our podcast uh, in the episode about the Garden of Eden. What kinds of people create the best place ever as a garden? Mm -hmm. This is people who live in a desert. And the garden with flowing water and with vegetation and you have all the food. Yeah. And, and also people who, I guess, uh, farmers. Yeah. They don't have to work for food. Yeah. But it's not people who live in the forest. Yeah. Or in the rainforest. Yeah. They won't have a garden of Eden. They will have something else. They, ha they will have a different fantasy, a relaxing fantasy about a special magical place where all their problems, day-to-day -day problems are gone. So if your day-to-day -day problems are not... Uh, the crop is ready or not ready, or the ground is good or not good, then y your fantasy will be different. So another thing here that is uh, something that is a, a cultural phenomenon derived from uh, the way that they live is the fact they say that in the Karasar, you were never alone. Hmm. You can't be alone because in the city, in the town, in the forests, 
in the mountains you can be alone but here no everybody goes together mm-hmm. you can't stay here we're moving mm-hmm. so this creates a whole culture uh, where, where they're having sex outside yeah everything was of importance is done underneath yeah. the open sky yeah and here there's some kind of a hint that they do they do have respect to the, for the sky as some kind of a deity that watch maybe they don't worship that deity but it There's some kind of importance that the sky is always above you because it's that that important and you always see it because the we- because of the weather there's no mountains or mm-hmm. forests so worst case scenario there's some clouds but the existence of the sky above you is some kind of a, mm-hmm. a god here maybe they don't worship it because they worship the, the horse god mm-hmm. but the fact that something important has to be witnessed. By the tribe or by the sky means that they do some, they do attribute mm. some importance to that right uh, I got a kick uh, out of uh, Daenerys uh, imagining uh, King's Landing I think she has uh, the King's Landing uh, syndrome <laughs> you know that <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you want to tell the people about you're from Jerusalem about the Jerusalem syndrome there's a very it I thought all of my life I thought it was a, a urban myth but uh, it's actually a very um, well uh, detailed psychiatric phenomenon that okay. people come to Jerusalem religious people usually from a background of not well educated mm. usually from United States mm-hmm. uh, they come to Jerusalem and they experience what you call the Jerusalem syndrome that the image and the fantasy that you have of Jerusalem is some, some golden quote unquote or something magical place the garden holy, of Eden. yeah or holy pure place yes. and you go to Jerusalem and as a guy and uh, someone who, who grew up there oh it's a beautiful city I love but it's, uh, it's dirty it's dirty and it's modern you have you know cars you have horns you have people walking to to to, to, to their jobs you have you know it's a city it's a city is a vibrant eh, more or less city uh-huh And uh, when you come with your expectation is that and there's such a big difference, big gap between your expectations and the, re- the realism, the yes. hard truth of reality, you crack s- something snaps there neurologically. Mm. And what usually happens, and it happens like 90 something percent of the times, they try to pure themselves by taking off all their clothes, putting on a toga or something like that. And going out to the streets and preaching that uh, you know uh, the whore of Babylon raped uh, Jerusalem blah 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 and it makes you wonder maybe sorry if I offend anybody but maybe Jesus himself had the Jerusalem syndrome because <laughs> Jerusalem was the sheets back then also it was a holy city and he came from Nazareth and he came and he saw that there's money lenders on the streets yes. and they're commercializing the 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 rituals and all the blood the blood they kill the animals so a lot of yellings and every time especially in holy cities in holy places there's I think across the history there's always a mini industry surrounding them if you go to Agra it's not an holy, holy place but Agra where the Taj Mahal uh-huh. there's yeah. a mini industry of yes. people that to take care of people who go yes. there In Mecca, I, su- I will never be there. <laughs> never be there. Sadly, <laughs> yeah, but I want to be there. I imagine that there's some kind of uh, industry there. Yes. there. Every pla- holy place, Varanasi, there's an industry wow. there. Yeah. So if you come to Jerusalem back then, even 2,000 years ago, so you see a lot of money lenders because people come from all over places. Yeah. They need to exchange their money, change their money, the currency. You see a lot of traders and merchants because there's a... It's l- probably l- pushy because uh, you're coming in only for today. Exactly. And tomorrow you're going. So and they have really a lot of competition because there's uh-huh. a lot of people there. You really experience... And a lot of money there to be... So if you make a good deal, you make a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And as Jesus, you come there and you say, <laughs> that is Jerusalem? What the fuck? I need to tell you, my brothers. <laughs> and then time will be all. Let's start with Jesus. And who? I think it was a maybe feminist uh, anti uh, sex sex negative feminist will disagree uh, but uh, the sex scene in the ending of the story mm. it's like Daenerys using her own sexuality yes to break 
as you break a horse, her quote unquote master or quote unquote husband. Yes. So it's like uh, you can criticize this as, uh, okay, she only uses her sexuality. That's like kind of demeaning towards women because they have a lot of, uh, they have a lot of other aspects to contribute besides their uh, sexuality. Mm-hmm. But here, because the Totraki are used to have sex in a doggy style, mm-hmm. which is more animalistic, because if you want to do the missionary position, you have to have a good mattress. <laughs> so people back then didn't do the missionary position. The fact that also she, you control the man controls everything and it's more depersonalized because yes. you don't see face it's mm-hmm. only action it's unrecommended don't do it <laughs> <laughs> oh it's nice if you like it Stop. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact the fact that she takes control of the action yes. and rides him yes it's some kind of a not only psychological in the respect of their relationship that she take control it's also she breaks down his cognitive expect- uh, expectations. Ah, mm-hmm. Not only that he's used to owning his women. Uh, women and penetrating them from the back, she forces him to look her in the eyes while she rides him. Mm-hmm. This is a political move. It's a political move. It's a political move. She, in that, in that uh, action, she broke him as a horse and took control of him. And then he's like, oh, this woman is different. Yes. Then you have... new avenues new mm-hmm. opportunities new possibilities and it, it happens in the third chapter about her so there's some kind of a drama change here the narrative takes a different path now she also adopts a lot of uh, dotraki uh, customs customs and uh, she di- she's dirtier she's always she uh-huh. oils her hair yeah so to your point uh, earlier a uh, good thing that i remembered it now about the Jerusalem syndrome and how I started that she's having uh, King's Landing syndrome because she imagines King's Landing as golden and stuff. And then when she sees King's, <laughs> King's Landing in season eight, she's like, she wants to purify it. Yeah. She just destroys the yeah. whole thing because it's just too much. That's like, and you know that I learned... I think that D&D wanted to destroy it. <laughs> if you want to make a... Uh, okay. you know, a psychological. Psychological or, you know, to put more into that season eight than it was really... If you want to look at a psychological analysis uh-huh. about something in season eight, it's, it's only psychological. Uh, you're, right. Of D&D. you're right. But maybe because the Neris will also destroy, is supposed to destroy the city just in a different way that makes sense, that is, uh, let's say, uh, written well, then maybe you could say yeah. that uh, something uh, snaps in her. And do you know that there is such a thing as Paris syndrome? Yeah. The Japanese people get it for, uh, yeah. uh, for the same reasons. Yeah. Because they have all these expectations. This is going to be the most beautiful city. Everything is going to be beautiful. Paris, in my eyes, is beautiful. But it's a city. Yeah. And then they snap. And it yeah. happens like a few times a year. It's not that rare. Yeah, it happens like uh, the Jerusalem syndrome, maybe now in uh, COVID. <laughs> and <the less. laughs> But it happens, yeah, like the same thing. And uh, you also have Stendhal's th- syndrome. 19th century French writer Stendhal. While visiting Florence, Stendhal's eyes fell upon Giotto's frescoes and later wrote, I was seized with a fierce palpitation of the heart. The wellspring of life was dried up within me, and I walked in constant fear of falling to the ground. Of course, we didn't start calling it Stendhal syndrome until 1989. That's when Italian psychiatrist Graziella Magarini, who worked for over 20 years at a Florence hospital, identified and named the condition in her book, La Syndrome di Stendhal. Okay, so let's, uh, let's end here. That was a lot of fun, mm-hmm. Omri. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we'd love uh, for you guys to check out our podcast, A Podcast of Biblical Proportions. You can find our website, podcastofbiblicalproportions.com, and find all the episodes there or wherever you're listening to podcasts uh, on uh, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, whatever it is. We're on a bunch of these platforms. And uh, so if you like the, this video, I'm sure you're going to like our, uh, our Bible breakdowns in a similar way. It's like 2,000 years from now. Two writers that are not a Game of Thrones uh, scholars will try to retail the story as we see Game of Thrones now. Because 2,000 years from now, people will look at Game of Thrones differently and they yes. will analyze and everything will be overanalyzed. Like we do indeed here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So we're trying to look at the naivety mm. and the originality of the story and like the, what they meant... <laughs> what they said, how yes. they say it, and right. how they uh, knew that their audience will get it. Yes, and we're uh, atheists, uh, secular, whatever, so we're not going to get into the 
the religious aspects uh, in terms like intra no, conversations no. and no. stuff we like only that. look at the story and we try to figure out through the story so it's a very different way of looking at the bible so yes the, and also the historical context obviously of course the it's all religious there. Uh, yeah. it's all there it's all oh. backed up okay so check it out and we'll see you there and we'll see you here whenever we post another uh, re-reading video bye everybody bye